All right, today we're going to start talking about Rene Descartes. Another big shot in the field of philosophy and frankly, in mathematics, uh, if you've ever had to plot a line on a graph, that's called the Cartesian coordinate plane. Cartesian, good old Descartes. So mathematician, philosopher, oh, uh, physicist, um, and another one of these guys, not, there aren't too many of them in the philosophy world, but he was one of these guys who was famous in his own time. Um, and so what we pick up, we pick up Descartes' meditations at a time when he has just kind of retired um, and he's decided that now that he is able to retire, he's able to relax and put his mind to a project that's been bothering him for a long time. And he wants to make sure that he can put metaphysics and epistemology, put philosophy on the firm ground that some might say, like you might think of Hobbes uh, wanting to take the methods of science and apply them to philosophy. Descartes wants to ground epistemology in something certain. He says, you know, if I can just find one certain thing, just like Archimedes, you might remember Archimedes said once upon a time, uh, give me one fixed point and I can move the heavens, right? There's this one thing that is certain that I can rest on or push off of that won't move, then everything else just becomes possible. So with Descartes, same idea, um, he thinks if he can find something that is guaranteed, something that's absolutely certain, then he'll be able to use that to build future beliefs on, right? He says, I know that throughout my, my whole life, I've had a lot of wrong ideas in my head over the years, and you know I've been fortunate enough to be able to ferret some of them out and uh, get rid of them, but I know that I probably still have some false ideas in my head, but I don't want to believe what's false. I want to believe what's true. I want my ideas to um, cohere as closely as possible to the truth and to reality. And so I'm going to try to find something upon which I can base my beliefs that will make me not just confident, but certain in them. So if I can just find one certain idea, there's one thing that I can know for sure, then that can become the basis. I can use that to learn all kinds of new things. It can become the basis for future knowledge. So that's his goal, right? When we talk about his project, his project is to find one certain thing. And now how is he going to go about it? His method. Well, he says, I could go through my head and try to get rid of all my false ideas, but I don't know which ones are false. So because what I'm looking for is not just what I actually believe in, but something that's absolutely certain, I am going to see what I can doubt and anything that I can doubt, I'll set it aside, I'll treat it as false. It may not be false, but I will set it aside and treat it as false because if I can doubt it, then it's not certain. And what I'm looking for is that one certain thing. So you might say his method, the Cartesian method, you might say, doubt everything. see what's left. I'm going to doubt every, every idea I have in my head, and if there's any that remains that I can't doubt, well then those will provide that certainty that I'm looking for to build my future beliefs on. Epistemolog epistemology will be solidly grounded, and everything will be wonderful. Doubt everything and see what's left. So he starts by saying, well, you know, I'm sitting here uh, in my, my fancy robe, because, you know, he's rich. He's, uh, and uh, I'm sitting by the fire in my beautiful mansion. I'm sipping my delicious wine, and I'm I'm observing the you know the candlelight. Um, surely all that's real. I mean, here I am sitting in my luxurious parlor, uh, staring at the candle. I see it. I smell it. Uh, I can touch it. If I thump it, it makes a little you know kind of wax sound. I don't know what sound it makes when you thump wax, but you get the idea. Uh, so, is it possible for me to even doubt that? And of course the answer is yes, right? He says, well, I gotta be a little careful because while I'm sitting here and I'm watching the fire and looking at the candle and I'm checking out my sweet, cool robe, um, drinking my delicious wine, uh, it's at least possible. Haven't I sometimes like had a dream where I thought I was sitting in front of the fire, sipping my delicious wine, 
uh, wearing my fancy duds. I mean, I remember having had a dream about that, and then I woke up, and it turns out that hadn't been true. So is it possible that I'm dreaming now? Yeah, I guess it is. Um, remember, what he's looking for is not just something he doesn't doubt, but something that is beyond doubt. So what he's going to do is try to take every idea he has and find a way to doubt it. And if there's a way to doubt it, he will treat it as false, for now anyway, right? So can I doubt it? Well, pretty quickly, he figures out that, you know, can I doubt that I'm touching my robe? Can I doubt that I'm looking at the candles? Golly, man, I got zillions of ideas in my head. I don't even know how many. I probably couldn't even name them all, but I know I have a lot of them. It's not going to work for me to go through all the ideas in my head one at a time and try to, <coughs> pardon me, and try to figure out if it's possible for me to doubt them. What I really need to do is look at the foundations for those beliefs, and if I can undermine or doubt the foundation, then I can throw all the beliefs out that are based on that foundation. So here we are sitting before the fire, right? He says, well, gee, I've had some experiences in the past where I was dreaming that I thought it was real. And moreover, don't your senses sometimes trick you? Don't you sometimes think you see somebody walking down the hall, but it turns out it's really somebody else? Has that ever happened to you? Or uh, you, know, you think you hear your mother's voice, but it's really somebody else, or maybe nothing at all, maybe you're just hallucinating. The point is, he says, that my senses have deceived me before, right? And so I can't be certain in them. They're not guaranteed. The things that I think are true that are based on my senses, right? My senses have deceived me before. And he goes on to say, it is wise to never trust anyone or anything that has deceived you before completely. Yeah, you might trust them provisionally, but you're a fool. If someone has lied to you, you are a fool, according to Descartes, if you trust them completely. And so, with that, he's able to say, look, the information about the world I get from my senses, sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes I'm mistaken about it. And therefore, everything that I know or think, based on sense experience, is doubtable. And that's all he needs, right? He doesn't have to say it's false. He doesn't have to prove it's wrong. He just has to crack the door open and say, I can doubt the information from my senses, so for now, I will set it aside and treat everything I know based on my senses as false. That's a pretty big deal. Because you can remember Locke, Hume, those the empiricists, right? They say everything you know is based on your senses, at least ultimately. So Descartes is able to doubt his senses, doubt the reliability of his senses, then he's able, at least from what uh, Locke and Hume tell us, he would end up doubting literally everything. Because all knowledge is based on our senses. He's not necessarily committed to that viewpoint, but surely most or at least a lot of what we know is based on our senses. And so for Descartes, he's able to sweep away a lot of that stuff and not have to deal with it, right? Do I doubt this individual candle, the fire, whatever? Anything that he knows or thinks based on his senses is open to doubt because his senses have deceived him before. He knows they're not 100% guaranteed or reliable. That means he can doubt them. And if he can doubt them, he will treat them as false. It's kind of a big deal. So what he's done here is he's taken all the knowledge that he gets from his senses and say those are open to doubt. All of empiricism, at least provisionally for now, is out the door. So what's left? I got a better marker here. Well, you may remember uh, from our discussion uh, for the second exam, um, Barclay, who didn't believe in the reality of your senses at all. So his alternative, or the alternative to empiricism, would be like rationalism. And so you may recall, uh, for Descartes in this case anyway, Descartes has eliminated all of the knowledge or all the ideas that he gets from his senses. And he says, well, gee then, what's left? Uh, things that aren't just, things that aren't based on my senses, things that don't rely on my senses for them to be true. Maybe something like math, math, math acts or mathematical definitions, things that are true just by virtue of reason. So for example, two plus two is four, right? Um, a square has four sides. And these are two of the examples he gives us. And he says, ah, 
maybe that's the certain thing I found. You know, I, I can doubt my senses because I know that they've been wrong in the past. I can say, well, I think I'm seeing something, but I could be mistaken. But it's a lot harder to doubt something like two plus two is four. Like try it. How do you even doubt that? Um, if you understand what two means, what plus means, what equals means, and what four means, you seem to be kind of tied into it. It's hard to doubt such a thing. So Descartes for a minute kind of sits on that and he thinks, well, gee, maybe truths of mathematics then. Maybe that will provide the one certain thing that I'm looking for that I can use as the basis for all my future knowledge. But he's not that, um, he's not gonna give up that easily. So he says, is there a way, is it possible for me to doubt that two plus two is four? Is it even possible to doubt? Because remember for Descartes, if he can doubt it, then it goes away. It doesn't count as this one certain thing. Um, and so <laughs> he sort of wonders, is it possible that a square has more than four sides or less? That's kind of part of the definition, but then he lights on this idea. He says, well, let me suppose. Now, I know it's not true, don't burn me at the stake, but let me suppose that God, instead of being supremely good and looking out for us, is actually sort of a bit of a trickster. Uh, I call him Ed, you call him, or Descartes calls him the evil deceiver. Perhaps God is not a supremely benevolent, powerful, good guy, but an evil deceiver who tricks me at every turn. And as I sit here before the fire, the candle, and all that stuff, and I say to myself, two plus two, like two, two, that's, that's four. That the evil deceiver is actually tricking me. That it's not really four, that the answer is like really five. But every time I count it up, the evil deceiver steps in, tricks my imagination, tricks my mind, and says, ha ha, I made him think two plus two is four. Or every time I count the sides of a square, I say one, two, three, four, it's freaking four. Um, it's the evil deceiver who's causing me to erroneously or mistakenly come to that conclusion. So the point is that what Descartes has done here is he has posited this idea that there is an evil deceiver, and it doesn't even have to be God, just think someone controlling your mind, right? Because what he's trying to do here is doubt the, rational, the rationalist foundations for belief. So in this case, he's trying to take something that's pure ideas, right? Not based on your senses, because we've already gotten rid of that, and see if he can doubt it. And he does this with this device, the evil deceiver. So the evil deceiver is responsible for, it's sort of a methodological step that Descartes uses in order to doubt the foundations of math, right? Pure reason. I can doubt my senses. Can I doubt pure reason? Doesn't really seem so, but then he's got this idea of the evil deceiver. The evil deceiver is always tricking me, even with things that seem like logically necessary truths, like a square has four sides, or two plus two is four. So every time I count up the size of the square, I come up with four, the evil deceiver laughs because the evil deceiver has tricked me into saying that it's only four. Somewhere right around here is where Descartes finishes his first meditation. He sort of says, well, you know, dang, I, I sat down and I, uh, I thought I was gonna doubt these things and, and figure out something certain and then I can use that one certain thing to you know, form the foundation for the rest of my beliefs. But here I am and I've kind of figured out a way to doubt all of empiricism and all of rationalism. That is, I can't trust my senses and I can't trust logic. What's left? Not much. And so he goes to bed. That's actually how it works. If you read the meditations, which you should, they're, they're short, they're accessible. Uh, they take place over the course of a few different nights, you know, upon his retirement. So as we get into meditation two, he shows up and he kind of recaps what he did the night before. Gee, you know, I was able to, to doubt the uh, empirical foundations of knowledge. I've been able to doubt the rational foundations of knowledge, and he kind of goes back through slowly to make sure he hasn't missed anything, because quite frankly, once you get rid of these two things, there really isn't anything left, you know? So he starts to despair a little bit, thinking, oh my, I may never come up to uh, this, this thing that I wanted. It may be that no knowledge is certain, there can be no certainty, and therefore all knowledge is opinion. Where does that leave us? 
bit of a problem. So he comes back the next day. He, he starts walking through his, uh, his previous arguments. Um, feels pretty good about them, you know, feels like they were pretty solid, and says, well, gosh, so what could be left? And this is where he lights on this famous phrase in the history of philosophy, the cogito. In fact, so famous is it that sometimes it is referred to simply as the cogito. And the phrase is, sorry, empiricism, sorry, rationalism, here you go. Cogito ergo sum. You've heard it before, I know, I think. Therefore, I am. Let the evil deceiver trick me. Let me be wrong about everything. Let me be wrong when I count the size of the square and call it the four and the answer is really 95 or whatever it could be. Let me be wrong about my senses. One thing that the evil deceiver can never trick me about is my own existence. Because if the evil deceiver is tricking me about everything, well, then I got to be here to be tricked. Right? Hey, that's not too bad. Right? The evil deceiver, uh, Ed, right? The evil deceiver makes me wrong about everything. But if I'm wrong about everything, then I must be be able to be wrong, that is, I must exist in order to be able to be wrong. So let the evil deceiver fool me about everything. The one thing that the evil deceiver can never trick me about is the fact that I exist. Now, what I am, who I am, what my properties are, those are all, all still up for grabs, but the fact of my existence is proven by the fact that I'm sitting here doubting, by the fact that I'm being deceived if we want to go that far. I can't be deceived unless I'm here to be deceived. That isn't too bad. I mean, it, you know, I, granted, there's a lot of work left to do, because let's face it, uh, if that's your grand conclusion, yes, you exist. What are you? I have no idea. Uh, what about you is true? There's no telling except my own existence. It doesn't really get us very far, but, you know, compared to what he had last night, right, which was nothing. So he's actually found this one certain thing. He's looking for something certain, I'll put that up here. That's his goal. His method was to doubt everything and see if there's anything left. He has obliterated the foundations of knowledge of empiricism and rationalism, yet he's able to come up with this one certain thing that even if he's wrong about everything, he must be there in order to be able to be wrong. That's pretty cool. Well, cool or not, that's what he comes up with. That is the cogito. This is his one certain thing, right? His own existence. And he says, oh, great. Well, now that I know I exist, I know that I'm sitting by the fire, I know that the candle is warm, I know that the wine is delicious, I know that two plus two is four. Wait a minute. He stops himself. And he says, I gotta be careful. I did find my one certain thing, but I can't just open the floodgates and let all my other, other ideas come rushing back in. I still got to be careful, like how many of them are related to this idea, you know? So I know that I exist, but what am I? Maybe I'm my body. No, can't go that far because anything physical about me is going to relate to my senses. I haven't given myself any reason to think my senses are reliable. So it's certainly possible that I'm just a brain in a vat, uh, you know, um, matrix stuff, right? That I don't really exist in this form that I experience myself in, that I'm being maybe manipulated, my mind is being manipulated, so I gotta be careful. I feel like I know who I am and I'm this body and all that, but uh, <clears throat> that's not certain yet. I can still doubt that I'm my body. Well, what is it that made me certain of my own existence? in some ways, the fact that I can be wrong, right? So what is this thing? The evil deceiver may trick me, but what is this thing being tricked? Well, it's a thinking thing, right? A thing that thinks, doubts, reacts, wonders, muses, posits, analyzes. So those are the activities. 
activities, right, of what it is that I am doing. Um, the evil deceiver may be able to trick me about what I am, but can't trick me about the fact that I exist. The very fact that I'm wondering and asking these questions is proof in itself. So what is the thing? Well, it's not the thing touching the wine glass. That's my body. Not certain about that yet. All I'm certain about, I guess, is that I'm a mind. Because I know that I think, even if I'm being tricked, I must be able to think in order to be tricked, right? So the mind is better known than the body. And he's got another argument to help me help prove this. He says, this whole time I've been sitting here, I've been burning the candle. When I first brought the candle in, it was fresh from the beehive. Still smelled like honey, right? It was white. Um, when I thumped it, it just made a little sound or whatever sound candles make when you thump them. Uh, so let's say it's what it looks like, what it sounds like, it smells like honey. I bet if you took a bite of it, it would smell like honey. It, it has this cylindrical shape. But as I've been sitting here meditating, right, doing my meditations on my Cartesian doubting, the candle has burned. And what's become of it? Well, what was once a white solid cylinder is now a puddle. And it's kind of gray. Maybe even a little yellowish, it's not really white anymore. The smell of honey, the smell of the honeycomb that I smelled when I first burned the candle, it's gone. It doesn't really smell like anything. When I thump it, when I thump that little puddle of wax, it goes swish instead of or whatever, right? In other words, all of the sensory information, right, that helped me know what this candle was, what it looked like, what it smelled like, what it sounded like, what it tasted like, what it felt like, all that stuff, right? The shape of it, all of that has changed. And yet I know that it's the same candle. So it must be that the reason I know it's the same candle is not based on my senses. Because all the sensory information has changed, right? It doesn't look the same, doesn't sound the same, doesn't smell the same, none of that is the same. So I can't say that I know that this is the same candle or the same piece of wax or whatever based on my senses because the sense experience has all changed. It must be then, let me take a step back, if I don't know it through my senses, then I don't know it through my body, right? My body is how, my, uh, is how I sense the world through my eyes, my ears, my nose, and all that stuff. Um, so because all of that can still be in doubt, and yet I know that it's the same piece of wax, it must be that I know it through some non-physical means. It can't be that I know it because of my senses, because all that information has changed. So it must be a mental act that, that makes me know that this is the same piece. In fact, he says, I behold it clearly and distinctly. He, unfortunately from my point of view, does not go on to define what he means by clear and distinct. He just sort of says, hey, it's clear and distinct, so you obviously know what it means. The point here is that I apprehend what that candle is, not by a physical act, not through my senses, but through a kind of an act of intuition, right? And so that is why he can say, the mind is better known than the body. As I sit here and analyze what I am, I can doubt all the physical realities of me. In fact, they can change and I would still be who I am. Um, moreover, I know that the wax is the same, although all of its properties are the same. So whatever information I get, it's physical information, that's not what makes it what it is, and that's not what helps me know what it is. It's a mental act. So the mind is better known than the body. Okay, then, what is this mind? What is it? Right? Um, kind of cutting to the chase, he says, uh, you know, he goes through a, a lot of different possibilities, and he comes to the stuff that I was talking about a minute ago where he says, you know, a thing that thinks, wills, questions, learns, right? Uh, something with, that does mental um, activity, that does rational work. Uh, and so he describes it variously as a spirit, a vapor, fire, or ether. That yes, my body exists, and we'll get to that in a minute, I guess. Um, my, where is my mind? Well, it's not in any one place, so it sort of pervades my whole being. So it's like an ether or a vapor, he says. And he even comes up with this phrase, it's, it's the ghost in the machine. This is actually what's known as Cartesian dualism. 
Uh, the dualism between the mind and the body. The mind exists, there's sort of mental substance and mental stuff, and then there's physical stuff. Um, so when you hear Cartesian dualism, that's what they're talking about, the mind-body distinction. Um, and here he says that, you know, I think, therefore I am, so what am I? Not a body, not the physical Descartes, I'm a mind, a thing that thinks, a, a vapor, fire, or ether, a spirit, or my favorite phrase, the ghost in the machine, right? Your body's like the machine, and your spirit is the ghost, and I guess that's where the police got the name for that album, so it goes. So here we have it. Descartes sets down in order to doubt everything, uh, lapses into despair off the, off the bat because you know he feels like he's eliminated all the possible foundations for knowledge, does end up finding his one certain thing in the fact of his own existence, uh, takes it a little further, sees what he can do based on that, does eventually decide that the mind is better known than the body. And in the end, if you make it all the way to the end of the sixth meditation, you'll find out that he uh, that he eventually comes to believe that all of the things he used to believe are perfectly true. And that is because, because the evil deceiver cannot deceive him about his own existence, right? He can deceive him about truths of math, but not about his own existence. That means that there is no such thing, there is not a supremely evil deceiver tricking me about everything, and if I'm not tricked about everything, then I can believe that 2 plus 2 is 4, the rationalist stuff. And moreover, because there isn't an evil deceiver, God would not let me be wrong about everything. So I can believe my senses, I can believe the truths of math, because the, the methodological point that I use to doubt those things, the evil deceiver, can't actually exist, because God would not allow it. Look, don't argue with me, go read the meditations, this is what he says. Um, and in some sense, he sometimes comes under fire, under criticism for, for uh, it's as though he just was not going to be satisfied until he could say, all the things that I believe are true. So we talk about doubt, but is it real doubt or is it just methodological doubt? Maybe you say it doesn't matter, that's fine. The guy we'll talk about, uh, Purse, you know, in the next section, he thinks that it is sort of problematic. He says something somewhere along the lines of, let us, not to, let us not pretend to doubt in our philosophies what we do not doubt in our hearts. And so it's a little bit of a slam on Descartes there because Descartes' doubt, he says, was not genuine. It was a methodological doubt. So of course he was never gonna be satisfied until he was able to resurrect all his old ideas and say, yeah, they're perfectly well-grounded too. So that's kind of the, Descartes' med meditations in a nutshell. I strongly encourage you to read them. They're really interesting. Um, they're not highly technical like Kant or really complicated or anything like that. They were really written to be read and understood by you and me. So totally worth your time. That's the story on Descartes' meditations. Doubt everything, see what's left. Empiricism, rationalism, gone with the help of the evil deceiver. But there's the one thing that I cannot doubt, the fact of my own existence. And as I start to analyze that and decide what it is, it reveals to me that the mind is better known than the body. I hope you got all that. Uh, we went through it kind of quickly, which is another reason why I encourage you to go read his meditations. Um, but that's Descartes for you. I hope he, he did it for you as much as he did it for me.